when we're in the world, it's bad for us. It's kind of like being in a sewer. We're constantly getting sewer water all over us, and eventually we start to smell bad. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is the culture, the world is pushing us in one direction, and if we don't fight, we're going to keep going in that direction. Wow, man, why is the world so bad? Because who is the prince of this world? The prince of this world is the devil. So I want to be very clear that the devil's goal and the devil's agenda is the same agenda that you're getting hit with in the world every single day of your life, whether you realize it or not. For example, the devil hates God. The world, the culture, the media says that God does not exist. They're on the same plane. But the reality is God does exist. I can think of nine proofs for the existence of God right here, right now, and I could rattle them off to you. I can think of two of them that are 100% scientific, that the universe was created 13.7 billion years ago, we can measure this with something called the WMAP satellite system. We've all heard of the Big Bang, that before this Big Bang, there was absolutely nothing, nothing. And then there was this explosion, chaotic explosion. And now here we are. How can something very well ordered come out of nothing? Impossible, unless there is God. Another just brief one is near-death experiences. I've been studying near-death experiences not from like Christians. I'm talking about from atheist doctors who will have somebody who just died on the table from a, hearty, a heart attack, cardiac arrest. Within eight seconds of having a heart attack, the brain shuts off and, and you die. Well, there's been so many cases, 20% of all people who, who have a cardiac arrest and come back to life have what's called a near-death experience, meaning that their body was laying there on the table, their soul came out of their body, was looking around the room. This is how come it's scientifically verified. They were observing things in the room. Oh, you used a bad word. You shouldn't use bad words and you're operating on people. Oh, you, you were over there. You went to the vending machine and got a Snickers bar. And then, so then they'd have this out-of-body experience. They would be visited by angels or relatives. They'd see a tunnel of light. This is very, very, very consistent. And, and medical scientists have been putting this down, near-death experiences. So 20% of adults, 85% of children have this, 85% of blind people have this, that they see things for the first time. So these are scientifically, medically verified that the soul exists. But what does the world say? There's no God. How does the world say that there's no God? Well, by providing for us false gods. What do you mean? What does the world say is important? Stuff. They're every day, you turn on the TV, I'm selling you something. You drive down the road, they're selling you something. You turn on the radio, they're selling you something. What does that mean? That means possessions are the most important thing to the world. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants you to worship false gods. Also, what else? Every time you turn on the television, they're giving me a false idea of the dignity of the human person. What? I've never heard of it. Nobody's ever come on television and said the human person is worth no dignity. What are you talking about? You crazy? You're pushing it over the line. No. Anytime you see human sexuality used in a way that's not as God intended, that's saying God does not exist. That's saying that the body is worth nothing. You can use your passions for whatever purpose you want just for fun. What's the reality that the passions, the body, the human life is sacred, yes? Human lives are sacred. I should not come and damage you or kick you or hurt you. Why not? Because you have the dignity of God built in you. Well, if the dignity of man is so sacred, that means the acts that create man are also sacred. If the acts are not sacred, the man that they create are also not sacred. So anytime I turn on the TV, which you do, and nine times out of ten, you turn on the television and there's intimacy between two people, how many times are those people married? Zero. And if they're married, that one, so I guess it's not zero, one time. If they're married, <laughs> those married people are doing intimate acts with people who are not their spouses. So every day you're seeing this. Every day you're hearing this. So every day you're getting preached to. Every day I get a homily from the world that's telling me that God doesn't exist, that man isn't important, that possessions are all that I want, that sex is all that I want, and I never hear the opposite from my pulpit. 
So that's why it's so critical that we go on retreats because the devil has one other great powerful tool. It's called distraction. In the olden days, St. Thomas Aquinas and even philosophers believed in the existence of God and they didn't have WMAP satellite systems. They didn't have all these medical technologies. They used this based on their human reason because they sat long enough. They thought long enough. But the problem is we're offered distractions. Now, I'm not saying that your phones are bad. I'm not saying that your computers are bad. But when do I have time to actually stop and pray and reflect and ask myself, who am I? Why did God create me? Is this what life is supposed to be like? If I continue down this path, where am I going? You don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I'm on the airplane. There's TVs on the airplane. I go to pump gas. There's TVs at the gas station. At least in the United States, there's TVs at the gas station. I, anywhere you go. I'm on the phone waiting on hold. There's music. So I never have time. I'm not saying these things are all bad. I'm saying we need time to stop. We need time to reflect. It's very important. And I heard that here, locally, they just passed same-sex marriage. That now a man and a man can say, I am like a man and a woman. What are you, crazy? That's not the same thing. We have a culture that's saying, if you talk against this, that's hate speech. You're not even allowed to talk about these things, so it might seem hopeless. You might say, oh, we're being surrounded. Because if you think about it, things have been getting worse, and things aren't getting better anywhere that I'm aware of. So we have to say, is it hopeless? It looks hopeless. It's not hopeless. When Jesus was on the cross, it looked hopeless. Only one apostle was there. It looked hopeless. Look, he's dying. Even the apostles after the fact, they were like, let's go fishing. Can't believe it. Haven't you heard that this guy who we thought was the Savior, he died on the cross? We were misled. But where it seemed like it was hopeless, where it seemed like the world was winning, God turned what seemed to be hopeless into the most important, powerful moment in human history. And you know what? How did that happen? Obedience to the will of God. I got here on Tuesday. Brother Gabriel said, will you please give the talk on situational awareness? And I said, sure, what's situational awareness? I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> and so I was a little bit stressed, and I went to Mass, and I had this cloud of darkness over my head, and I received Holy Communion, and I said, Lord, what's situational awareness? He's like, you know, aware of the situation. Okay, got it. What do you want me to talk about, Lord? That's, that, that, everything that I'm going to share with you are things that I do in my own life. I said, what do you want me to talk about, Lord? Even my man, Cullen, he was like, what do you have to offer us? I was like, nothing. He's like, well, why would you come here? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> and I was being genuine. <laughs> I have no idea. So I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? The most important thing, my son, for these young people is this, the will of God. One person who's following the will of God can change the world. You might say, I'm just a girl. I'm just 13 years old. One person who's following the will of God can change the world if you have the will of God. The Virgin Mary was one person who said yes to the will of God, and she changed the world. Many saints that you're going to hear about in these skits said yes to the will of God, and they changed the world. That's one person. At this retreat, we have more than one person. So the will of God... Even when bad things happen is the way to change the world. So there's this math equation by St. Maximilian Kolbe. It's very simple. Capital W is God's will, plus sign, the cross, little w equals holiness. If I sacrifice my little w, my little will, for God's will, that's a sacrifice, I become holy, and also, even if it's just menial things, what happens? Grace flows. So the will of God in all things, you don't know who you're going to touch. So I'm going to get to in a minute how you know the will of God, because that's important. How can I do God's will if I don't know what God's will is? So in this retreat, a couple of things are going to happen. In this talk, I'm going to tell you how to know God's will. How do I do God's will? That's important. 
other things that we're going to discuss are some spiritual warfare, how to overcome some of the greatest temptations that we face. Those are all things that we're going to do. But I have to give you one piece of advice. I have been to five adores or believe in the United States. I've never helped in this capacity, which I've been invited to do here. But I have noticed that those who fully participate, God touches their lives. I'll see the first two days, some of the kids will be like, I don't like this religious stuff. I'm just going to stand in the back and not do anything. But then by day four, they're like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Okay. Why? Because they fully participated. What does that mean? Well, go to confession as soon as possible. After the confession talk, you make Father think that that was the best confession talk he's ever heard because you're running to confession after that. Can I be first? Can I be first? Because the sooner you get to confession, the sooner God's grace will flood into your life and the sooner and the more receptive you'll be to hearing the voice of God. Okay, very important. Participate also in the action songs. Have fun. Relax. That helps us because I myself, I'm shy. I don't want to. I'm, I'm uh, melancholic and I'm introverted. I don't like to do things. So, but it's good for me to force myself anyways, right? It's good for you to look like a fool sometimes. It's good for your, it's good for your uh, humility. So that's another thing. Participate in that way. But the absolute most important form of participation you can do is pray. Actually, really Really pray. Think of it this way. Maybe you don't want to be here. Guess what? You're going to be here anyways. I don't want to be here four days. Too dang bad. You're here. You might as well do it. What happens if you died after the retreat? And God says, well, thank God I sent you on that retreat. Well, actually, Lord, I know. I know you did not pray. I gave you every opportunity. You were there for four days. You didn't even try once to pray. Oh, that's not going to be good, I promise so how do I pray? Sometimes the kids will say, how do I pray? You know how I respond when they say, how do I pray? Please tell me. I don't know how. I say this. Arr! What? Please, I just want to know how to pray. Arr! What's wrong with this guy? Does he have rabies? Is he going to bite me? This guy from America, he's on drugs? All Americans are on drugs? I didn't know. Arr! What is R? A R R. Arr, you get it? A, there's many ways to pray. This is just one that I like. It helps me. Acknowledge, acknowledgement. What does that acknowledgement mean? Acknowledge that God is present. Acknowledge who you're speaking to. Many times I say, I prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done. No, you did not. You said incantations. You, you repeated uh, an essay on God, but you did not pray. So what does that mean? Acknowledge that God is present. That's what I did beforehand. The way I do it, you don't have to do it this way. I, I, because I'm low IQ, I have to tell myself exactly, God, I believe you are present. God, I believe you love me. I know you love me. God, I know you're guiding me. So acknowledge, and when I do that, I really do, and I, and I pause, and I'm like, yeah, I do believe that. God is really present. Some little thing happens. Some little uh, sputtering goes on in my heart or in my mind. So that, that's A, acknowledge. Second, R is relate. Well, you still have to pray. So I acknowledge that God is present, or I acknowledge the Blessed Mother is present, or I acknowledge my guardian angel is present. And in those cases, it's all true. You're not just throwing up prayers and nobody's listening. So I acknowledge who I'm speaking to, and then I talk to them like I'm really talking to them. So if it's just a general prayer, you're here, you have free time, you say, Lord, I believe you're here. You show some sort of reverence, and you say, Lord, this retreat is so lame. That guy from America, what a waste of money. Big league, my goodness. Could have done better than that. Relate, and that's okay. You tell the truth. God knows you. And then finally, the last R is receive. Listen, this is the absolute most important aspect of prayer. Who's smarter, you or God? God. Anytime we pray throughout this retreat, we're going to pray the rosary. One thing that always burns me beyond belief, I haven't told any of the brothers or sisters this yet, is that when we do the living rosary, the balloon rosary, a lot of times the teenagers, they're like balloons, playing with balloons. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thee. There go the balloons. <laughs> Hope no birds choke on the balloons. What I want you to do is actually pray. 
So how do you do ARR when you're praying the rosary? Because you're not really relating. One, you're acknowledging that the Blessed Mother is present. Let's just say Fatima and Lourdes, for example. The Virgin Mary would appear to the seer only after the rosary had begun. She was there. Only one person saw it. So when you're praying the rosary, you are speaking to the Mother of God. For me, I imagine it. I imagine that the Virgin Mary, for example, if she's like sitting up here, talk, watching this talk and saying, okay, change subject. Okay, give him a grace because he's talking too much about that. So when you're praying and you're, we're in the circle, praying the Hail Marys, visualize either that the Virgin Mary is present or know in your mind there's this sense of the presence of the Virgin Mary. And when you're praying these recitation prayers, you relate them with as absolute much love as possible, as if you were speaking to the Virgin Mary, because guess what? You are speaking to the Virgin Mary. Well, how do I receive? We'll talk about this in my talk tomorrow about Mary, but the rosary is scriptural, so that the Holy Spirit works in it, and you will get little enlightenments. That's one way you can receive, little light bulbs that go off in your head. A second way is to just know of all the promises and graces that you're getting. The next thing that you're going to encounter on this retreat is Eucharistic adoration. Acknowledge that is really, 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 really Jesus. The same Jesus that was walking the earth 2,000 years ago, working miracles, is the same Jesus who is there on the altar. And guess what? He only worked miracles 2,000 years ago when people treated him like God. If you want to receive grace, you have to be disposed. So you have to be reverent. God is really present. Act like it. And then you just talk to him like the Lord. And then you listen. He speaks. He speaks. He speaks. He speaks. He does it in the silence of your heart. He does. You, maybe you're lucky. I've never heard words yet, but I feel these tuggings. So that's that. So how much time do I have left? I've got exactly how much time I planned on. You're so good. Love you, woman. So how do I hear the voice of God? How do I know when God is speaking to me? How do I listen? Very simple. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that your most secret core, that when the just man is silent, he has God in his depths. Your conscience when you're very quiet and you're still, you'll feel a tugging of your conscience. This requires a little bit of practice. The best analogy I can give is, let's say, for example, there was an old woman and she had a bunch of groceries and she was trying to open her car door and you're standing there. How would your heart feel? It would be like, oh, I should really go help her, but I don't want to. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm introvert. But you just feel this tugging like you should do it. That's your conscience. That's the voice of God echoing in your depths. Similarly, that's the way God speaks often. Now, I didn't hear a voice saying, go help that old woman, boy. That didn't happen. But I, I just felt a tug, right? But if that tug had a voice, it would say, go help that old woman. Stop worrying about yourself, right? That's what that tugging would be pulling at me. Similarly, you might have the same tug before you sin. And you're, the, the vo it's not a voice, although it might, we use the word voice. You feel that tug like, I really shouldn't be getting on this website. It's a tugging. You don't hear the voice, but if that tugging had a voice, it would say, step away from the mouse, walk back from the keyboard, close the laptop, and walk out the door. That's what the voice would be saying if it had a voice. So number one, listen to your conscience. In the catechism says, at every moment of your life, the voice echoes in your depths, urging you to do good and to avoid evil. So yes, it's your conscience, but God often speaks through that same tugging. That's how you hear. In fact, one thing that I do in my life, I take a piece of paper with me to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. After I do my prayers, I say, Lord, what do you want of me? And if you get a tugging, like love your sister, go call your grandmother, you write it down. Because oftentimes the Lord gives us inspirations and we are easily distracted and we forget that inspiration. One of the habits of highly effective people is writing down resolutions. But I'm not writing down my resolution. That's the resolution of the Lord. So that's one way you can know the will of God. Second way is what are your responsibilities of the present moment? That's the will of God for you. So, for example, 
Your responsibility right now is you are a young person at a conference. So God's will for you is to be the best young person at the conference that you possibly can be. And if you do that, this is a beautiful thing. If you do that, that makes you holy. So when you're at home and there's homework to be done, you say, God, what is your will for me? You know you want to play video games. You know you want to get on social media. But deep in your conscience, if you said, Lord, what is your will for me? He would say, do your homework and then do those fun things. And this is the important part. You have to do your homework anyways. You might as well do it as a part of God's will and let that make you holy. And what you will find out is that the things that you do out of love for God, not only do they make you holy, but you do them better. I was getting D's in college in math until I started doing everything out of love for God. So, for example, I'm taking a test. Lord, I offer you this test. I'm going to do the best job possible. I write my name so beautiful. Gabriel, beautiful. Okay, circle the letter A. Ooh, perfect circle. Circle the letter B. Mm, perfect circle. Ooh, I'm so, Lord, I love you so much. Look at this. Mm, yes, so good. Maybe you've seen the movie The Princess Bride. There's a, a, a scene in the very beginning where there's this farm boy talking to a girl named Buttercup. But he's a farm boy, and she's, like, special. And so every time she would ask him for something, farm boy, fetch me that pail. Farm boy, please clean up the floors. Farm boy. And all he would say is, as you wish, as you wish, as you wish. But he was saying the words, as you wish, as if he was really saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. If you do that for God, Everything you'll do will be far greater than if you didn't do it out of love for God. Think of all of the best athletes, Michael Jordan, uh, Roger Clemens, Nolan Ryan. They all played their best games when they offered it out of love for their dead father or their dead mother. Tiger Woods, too. My dad just died. I'm going to do the best I can to show how much I love my dad. Imagine, who do I love more than my dad or my mom? God. How much more, how much greater will my action be? And not only that, because God is so generous and loving, he sees your efforts. And he says, I'm going to bless this work because he's doing so good. He's, not even do he's doing it out of love for me. Uh, an example I give is, it's Mother's Day and you're going to make a cake for your mama. Mama, I love my mama. I'm going to make a cake for mama. I'm going to put the cake in the oven and put it to 800 degrees because Mama's going to be home in 10 minutes. And so I don't have time to cook it for 400 degrees for 20 minutes. But then you go to the bathroom with your cake in the oven. You're in the bathroom and your mom gets home and she says, Ay, Dios mío, ¿por qué? Why is, why is this cake on 800 degrees? It's going to burn the house. I don't even know if ovens go to 800 degrees. She puts it to 400. Afterwards, you come out and say, Mom, I made you this cake. Oh, it's so beautiful. She might yell at you for the cake thing. But what does she do? She helps you. Similarly with God. He, he doesn't care. You're playing basketball out of love for God. It's bouncing on the rim. God can easily go like this, make the ball go in. In my experience, everything I do has been much better when I did it out of love for God. I have to end with this. God's will for your life is the absolute only thing that can make you happy. He has planned from the beginning of time who you're going to be, whose lives you are going to impact. But you have to listen. You have to participate and start here, start now, where you have all of these people with you. Please, I beg you, please participate. It's very important. God's going to speak to you. God's going to touch you in an extraordinary way. I guarantee you this will be one of those major moments of your life. Even if you've been here several times, I promise God's going to do great things. We'll go ahead and close in a prayer. In the name of the Father, we'll kneel down. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll pray one Hail Mary. Because the Blessed Mother did the will of God perfectly, and she will help us to do God's will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you'll subscribe so that you can get notifications about future videos. Also, I have two other YouTube channels that I want you to check out. On one channel, I have extremely well-produced, high-quality content. On another channel, I have short, concise videos on the spiritual life and other things Catholic that I know you're gonna love. The easiest way to get there are with these links, or you can go to my website, truefaith.tv. 